This is Real Estate Rookie episode 122. We didn't know what we were doing at all. We hadn't found bigger pockets yet. We didn't even know anybody who owned real estate. We just thought this sounds like a good idea and did it. And luckily it was. And uh, by the way, we just 1031 exchanged and turned that $20,000 down payment into $20,000 a month on a 25 unit apartment building. My name is Ashley Kerr, and I'm here with my co-host, Tony Robinson. What's going Tony, on, Ash? How's, I, <laughs> how are things going some, in your world today? I have some sad news to let out for you and tell you. So, Oh, man. All right. My Let's self-storage deal, it died today. Oh, man. So it I'm went through so a phase one. I'm that, Ash. I paid out the $3,500 for the phase one environmental study to be done. It was... Highly recommended in the phase one to do a phase two environmental study. That would have cost $6,500. So I, my broker and negotiated with the sellers that they would pay for it if the, if it failed, I would pay for it if it passed and there was nothing wrong and continue. Well, we needed them to extend the due diligence period to do the phase two. Well, all of a sudden there was some kind of miscommunication and the attorney said, no, they're not going to do that. Uh, so then we tried to understand why and asked for an extension. And I agreed that no matter what I would pay for the phase two. And so, um, got the final email today that they have decided to kill the contract, cancel it because it's after the due diligence period and they're not going to extend it. Uh, the sellers, I guess, firmly believe that there is no need for a phase two environmental and they don't want to waste time. My broker thinks that they have another deal or another buyer in the pipeline. So they're just going to go and take that offer now. But I would think that any reasonable investor would want a phase two environmental. So, I mean, there's always a chance that deal falls through. And but um, yeah, so that's where I'm at that, with the self-storage. Well, I, I'm sorry to hear that, but I, I, I think th there's also a lesson in that, right, is that if you as the investor, if you have your criteria, mm -hmm. if you have your kind of line drawn in the sand about what kind of deal you're willing to accept, you have to have the courage to hold that line when there's pushback, right? Yeah. Because you, you very easily could have said, Ash, like, all right, seller doesn't want to do the phase two, whatever. Let's not do it. Let's move forward. Let's get the deal done. But you have the the patience and the wisdom to say, hey, I know what my investing philosophy like dictates that I do in this moment. And it is to get that phase two. And if I, if, if I can't, then okay, it's not the right deal for me. Yeah. And that's all right. Because I, I'm very much like fast paced moving, like, let's just do it. And I spent a lot of time asking other investors that I look up to what I should do in this scenario. And they all told me pretty much the exact same thing. So I took their advice and I'm really glad I did. And I didn't just like, oh, okay, I'll take a risk. I'll take a chance. I really want this property and um, mm. go through with it without the phase two. So. It, it's easy oh, to do that, right? Especially if you're like excited, hungry, you want to yeah. keep growing, you want to keep, you know, it's like, it's easy to do that, but it's also, it's also dangerous. Right. right. And it was seller financing too. So it was even like, well, I, it's not even a balloon payment until five mm. years. Like I have five years to figure it out and what to do. So mm -hmm. I think uh, just all that combined, I'm really glad that I didn't decide to pr proceed and I'm proud of myself. And that $3,500 spent was an opportunity cost of not getting into go. a bad deal. There you go. I love, I love the positive spin on what could have been a not so positive mess uh, yeah. message for you. Okay. So let's hear it. I know behind your smirk before we started, you have some <laughs> exciting news to tell me. <laughs> uh, I got some, I got some good news finally. So for a 1031 exchange, um, we we finally found the the replacement property. So you hear you're, the you guys will actually hear a little bit about the 1031 exchange at the end of today's episode with today's guest. Um, but I sold one of my Airbnbs in Joshua Tree, my partner and I. Um, and you know you have a very limited amount of time to find the property that you're going to replace it with. Um, and we had been submitting offers like nonstop, and we just kept getting beat out. Or we had one where the seller accepted, but then decided they didn't want to sell anymore. Like just weird things happen, like left and right. Um, so we actually put in two offers on two different properties over the weekend, and we have accepted offers on both of them now. Um, so we gotta we gotta kind of figure out how we're gonna make both of those deals work. But 
either way, we found a property to put the, the 1031 exchange funds into. That way we don't have to worry about paying capital gains taxes on the, on the money that we made. Yeah, because when was your uh, date to identify? When was that up? It was... Like in like close, five days. Right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we were, we were very, very close uh, to, to not made, meeting that deadline. So yeah. I'm glad For we were a ten- we'll talk about at the end of this episode what 1031 exchange is. So I won't go into it, but too much. But there is like a timeline. When you sell your property, you have to identify a new property and then you have to close on a new property within a certain amount of time. So it is kind of rushed um, if you don't already yeah. have something lined up. But um, yeah, it can can go quick. That's for sure. Yeah. Um, well, awesome, so let's Tony. Talk, That's great. Yeah. Well, let's talk yeah. about today's guest, right? Um, I'm, I'm super pumped to have today's guest on the show. Um, this is someone that, that played a big role in, in me making the transition into short-term rentals. Um, but today we have Avery Carl on the podcast. So for those of you that don't know Avery, um, she was a guest on the OG podcast, episode three. I said it earlier, I think three... 64. So if you look up uh, the BP uh, Real Estate 364, she's on there. Um, and she's an agent. She's a short-term rental operator. She's a long-term rental manager operator. So just lots of really good things she brings up in today's episode. Yeah. And usually on Saturdays, we do the rookie reply, but we brought her on today because she has a new book coming out called Short-Term Rentals, Long-Term Wealth. Uh, so you're going to hear her talk about how to analyze a market to find a short-term rental and then also how to analyze a short-term rental and then managing it and why her and her husband decided to self-manage instead of paying a management company. And when she talked about that, it actually made me consider quitting as a podcast host and going on to managing as a short-term <laughs> rental manager. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But Tony, if you're hiring, let me know. But uh <laughs> Uh, so just it's really great information compacted into such a short uh, episode. So um, you guys take a listen and let us know what you think. Um, let us know on Instagram or uh, in the Real Estate Rookie Facebook group. And don't forget to join us in the forums to um, biggerpockets.com. Tons of experienced investors in there and rookie investors. And we have our own little Ricky channel to uh, where you can ask Ricky specific questions. Well, let's bring Avery onto the show. Avery, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for joining us today. Can you start off telling everyone a little bit about yourself and how you got started in real estate? Yeah. Thank you guys so, so much for having me. Uh, so I got started in 2016. Bought We bought our first rental then. Uh, we bought a long-term rental in Nashville, where we were living at the time. We're in the panhandle of Florida now. And um, we saved every single day. I put my husband and I on a $20 a day budget for a year for us to save for a $100,000 house in in Nashville, which does not exist anymore, by the way. And um, finally, at the end of that year, those $100,000 houses were now $120,000, $150,000 houses. And so we spent every last dollar that we had and some dollars that we didn't have on that one rental. And we didn't know what we were doing at all. We hadn't found bigger pockets yet. We didn't even know anybody who owned real estate. We just thought, this sounds like a good idea and did it. And luckily it was. And uh, by the way, we just 1031 exchange and turned that $20,000 down payment into $20,000 a month on a 25 unit apartment building, but I'll get to that later. Uh, so when we got the first rent check on that, we thought, oh, wow, this is something that we do want to scale. We do want to build a business around this. And so then we started consuming all the content, reading all the books, listening to all the podcasts. I think we both binged every single Bigger Pockets episode that was out at the time in like two weeks. We were obsessed with it. And we had just enough for one more single family down payment left. And we thought, well, what can we do? What can we buy that is going to make us the most amount of money, the fastest so that we can scale our portfolio more quickly? And so we landed on short-term rentals and um, long story short, there's a lot of regulation issues in Nashville, so we didn't feel comfortable doing it there. But we thought, well, where can we go? Where can we buy a short-term rental that it's just the normal thing for people to go to this place and rent houses? You don't have to worry about uh, the regulations. So we landed on the Smoky Mountains in Tennessee, which is about three hours east of Nashville. Uh, bought our first one there. Again, had no idea what we were doing. Didn't really have any mentorship. It was just solely like, I think we can do this and I think we can manage it remotely. And we did it. And it was terrifying at first, but it crushed it. And we scaled that one property, one short-term rental in the Smokies into five over 
the next year and a half. About on probably our second property, uh, I got my real estate license and the short-term shop, our real estate company was born. Uh, I found that in that market and some of the other markets we were looking in, there weren't really any real estate agents who could answer our questions about remote self-management or even return on investment. So I became that agent, bridged that gap. Uh, and now we have six offices in six different markets, about to open up two or three more. And since those first five short-term rentals, we have scaled to 96 doors. And we bought our first door in 2016. It's 2021 now. So pretty quick. We were, uh, and we were able to use all that short-term rental income to scale more quickly, not necessarily into more short-term rentals. We have eight short-term rentals. Everything else is traditional, long-term, and multi. So... Uh, it's just a really good strategy for any level experience investor, whether you're new and really looking to bootstrap and just scale as quick as you can and, and make as much money off of as few properties as possible to buy whatever else you want, whether it's multi or long term, uh, or just to buy more short terms. It's really whatever your investment goal is. But short terms really are just like a, a nice little cash flow turbocharger for any portfolio. Every what what a fantastic and inspiring story, right? I think a lot of the listeners are hearing you say from 2016 to 2021 when we're recording this to go from zero to 96 doors is absolutely amazing. Now, I've mentioned your name on this podcast before, right? Like you were the the kind of uh, like lightning rod or your story is what sparked my interest in short-term rentals as well, right? So for the listeners, it was episode 364 on the real estate podcast, Bigger Pockets Real Estate Podcast that Avery was a guest on. So if you want to hear her story in, in detail, go check out that episode. But honestly, Avery, it was, it was hearing your story that made me think like, man, short-term rentals is the asset class I want to be in. Um, and then I, you're my agent also, right? So when all the houses that I bought, I purchased from you as well. So um, I just want to make sure that everyone knows that you know, they see me as the short-term rental kind of guru and expert, but I see you and your husband, Luke, as the ones that kind of brought me into the game. So I just want to publicly announce my appreciation for all that, that you guys have done. Oh, well, thank you so much. And you, it's, you're the one who did it. You just followed in our footsteps and we're happy to help. And that's, you know, what we do for a living now at the short-term shop is to help other investors go down the path that we did. Avery, you had mentioned we. Is that your husband, Luke, that you were talking about? Or do you have other business partners? My husband, Luke. Yeah. So when I say we, I mean uh, my husband and myself. Uh, I do the sales side of the business and he does the management of all of our rentals, both short and long. Even though the long terms are with a property manager, he does you know, what we need to do on our end. And he's the educator at the short-term shop. So he's teaching all of our clients everything they need to know about the automation tools and how to self-manage and really, you know, busting through those limiting beliefs for them about remote self-management. Yeah. It was about a little over a year ago today when we closed on our first cap in, in the Smoky Mountains. And I remember right before that, uh, my wife and I were sitting down on the couch with Zoom open and your husband, Luke, was going through like the short term shop, like introductory course of how to run your first Airbnb. So um, can't speak highly enough of it. But anyway, <laughs> enough of me professing my love for you and your husband. Um, <laughs> we love y'all too. <laughs> <laughs> so you're, you're at 96 doors right now, right? And you said the, the majority of those are long term rentals. Given what you know about the the power, the the, the cash flow of short term rentals, why not make your entire portfolio all STRs? Like why still keep that balance between the two? That's a really good question. And there are several answers to it. Uh, the first one being that when we started, it was not necessarily our goal to have a hundred short-term rentals. Our goal is to be, you know, passive income. And while short-term is passive, it is definitely more work. And so there's that aspect of it is that, uh, you know, our apartment buildings are definitely more passive. Uh, but a diverse portfolio is really the main reason. So COVID is a really good example of that. And last year when the, the first shutdowns happened and, you know, short-term rentals were shut down, we thought, okay, well, crap, here it is. Short-term rentals are going down. Good thing we have all these long-term rentals. And then two weeks later, when everything, all of it was opened back up, at least in the states that we operate in, uh, it was actually the opposite. The short-term rentals boomed. Like the short-term rentals 
quadrupled in income, whereas it was our long terms that we actually had to worry about with the eviction moratoriums. And luckily, we only had one eviction, so it wasn't a big deal. But just knowing in that situation when everything was so uncertain that we have this other asset class, no matter which one we have to worry about at the time, we have another one that can support us if one of the asset classes starts having a little bit of a problem. So diverse portfolio is really the main reason. That's something that I learned during COVID too. My husband has a dairy farm and then we have our rental properties. And I always thought our rental properties were going to be the backup to the dairy farm. Like if we didn't want to do it or it wasn't going well anymore. And then during COVID, the farm stayed the same. Like there, it was not impacted at all. And then here we were like, oh my gosh, what if we have people that aren't paying? We can't evict them and we're going to have to use our farm income to support the rentals. And it really changed our mindset. Like, okay, we need a lot of different income streams coming in so that if one is not doing well, we have those other ones to support that one and to live off. So I love that. Is there anything else that you're doing to kind of diversify? So you have your your company now, the short-term shop, you have long-term rentals and then short-term rentals. Is there anything else? Uh, we also have a mortgage company. So we have the short-term shop. We have the mortgage shop, which is a mortgage company now that we just launched that focuses on investor clients. And then we also diversify by being in different markets. So our short terms are in three different markets. Uh, our long-term single families and duplexes are across two markets. And then our multis are in a another market. So we're in like six markets total. Let's uh, get into that there of trying to find a market, analyze a market. How can a rookie investor find their first market that they're going to buy a short-term rental in? So there's... A few ways you can do it. I mean, the easy way is to go on Google and see top places to invest in short-term rentals, but we'll go about it the independent way first. So really the way that I came uh, came to the markets that we decided to invest in before there were all these lists everywhere, and now a lot of our markets are on these lists that we bought in, um, is I thought of places that when I was a kid that we went on vacation where we stayed in a, a cabin or a condo or a beach house rather than a hotel because I thought, well, somebody owns these things. Somebody owns these places that we're staying. So why can't it be me? And then we looked further into it. And yeah, it is just a lot of investors like ourselves that own these things. Or some of them are what I would call vacation homeowners that they just, most of them are vacation homeowners. But anyway, individuals such as ourselves that own these. And so that is a good indicator, those types of markets that, uh, the regulations are going to be friendly for short-term rentals. If it's a place that, you know, since I was a kid in the nineties that people have been short-term renting, well, that was Airbnb didn't exist then. So these are areas that the regulations are very, very established since before the internet in some cases, like I own a, a short-term rental in Destin, Florida, people started vacationing there and staying in vacation rentals in like the thirties and forties. So um, these areas, I call them mature vacation rental markets. And anybody can think, okay, you know, if you're in California, maybe you went to Big Bear or maybe you went to, um, you know, Tahoe or somewhere like that when you're a kid. So just think of places that you've been where you didn't stay in a hotel and you stayed in a rental and that's a good place to start. One, one follow-up question for me, Avery, and you, you kind of touched on this a little bit, is the, is the regulations piece, right? Um, so let me pose this question to you. Would you rather invest in a market that has very strict short-term rental regulations established, but strict or a market that has no short-term rental regulations? I would go strict, but established because the good, the security there is that they're established. If there are no regulations, then it's not if the regulations are coming, it is when the regulations are coming and you don't know what those are going to be. So I would rather go with strict, but established than no regulations at all. Yeah, to totally, totally agree with you. And, you know, I was talking to another short-term rental investor and he made this point and it's just like really stuck with me. And what he said was that the difficulty of getting a permit for a short-term rental is in no way connected to the demand in that market, right? So say that they decided in the, in the Smoky Mountains to make it significantly more difficult to get a short-term rental permit. That doesn't mean that the 12 million people a year that visit the park are going to stop going. It just means that there's a decrease in competition for those that are willing to jump through the hoops. So it, it's just, I think for some rookie investors, when they hear that it's, oh man, it's so hard to get a permit or you know, there's a lot of rules you have to follow, that's not necessarily a bad thing. If anything, it might be a benefit to you as a person that's willing to make it happen. Exactly. And just make sure that you do all that research and know what the regulations are up front.
Yeah. And can we, I guess let, let's pause on that for a second, right? So say that I'm, I'm a new investor and I want to figure out like, Hey, what are the regulations? Like, how do I figure out what the regulations are for any given market? What's the recommended route to kind of figure those things out? I mean, honestly, the bigger pockets forums are a really great place to start, but assuming you're in a vacuum and those don't exist, you want to call the city or county codes and planning departments, and they'll be able to tell you what those regulations are. And they're like super friendly. Like I've called like a few of these different like planning departments. I don't know, maybe they just don't get a lot of phone calls, right? About short term <laughs> rental permits, but usually they're pretty open and they're pretty willing to, to kind of share that information and and lay the process out for you pretty, pretty clearly. So I just want to touch on the regulations because I know that's a piece that a lot of people kind of get caught up on. So going back to how you kind of defined or, or decide on your markets, your your initial hunch was, let me go to the places where I know people are, are naturally vacationing. Once you kind of said, okay, here, here are a couple of markets that, that meet that criteria, what should I be looking for next? Are there revenue targets you're looking at? Are there price points, their visitation data? What are the other pieces that you look at to kind of support that decision? Well, you definitely want to have an idea of what you can afford, uh, because if you're going to look somewhere like Aspen, you better have a really big budget, a really big prequal. But uh, so you want to make sure that you're looking at markets that you can afford. And then once you know, okay, I can afford to buy in this market, then you can get some subscriptions to some of the data services to see what properties should be making. Uh, AirDNA is a big one. It's the data is not perfect, but it's pretty good. Uh, you're probably going to have to get a Price Lab subscription when you buy anyway. And I've heard you talk about this several times, Tony. The Price Labs market dashboards have really good data on what properties should be doing. So you definitely want to figure out what can I buy and how much are these things making? Do Does the amount of money that it will probably make make sense for the amount of money that I'm paying to get the property? One one follow up, and we talked about this a little while ago about the the prices of properties, right? What in your mind, Avery, what's the difference between an expensive property and overpaying? Because I think a lot of times new investors confuse those two terms, right? They see an expensive property or a property that goes over asking and they immediately think they're overpaying. But I feel like there's some more kind of layers to peel back behind that. Yeah. Yeah. So especially the way that the real estate market is now, a lot of people see what the previous buyer paid for it or what the seller paid for the property and they get really hung up on, oh, wow, this has doubled in value in the last two years or last five years or however long. And they get really hung up on, well, I'm overpaying because they only paid 250 and they want 600. But you can't really get caught up in what someone else paid for a property. You need to get caught up in, does it make sense? And am I able to profit the amount that I want to? Am I getting the return that I want to at the price I'm able to get it for? Because I mean, even in any asset class in, or even a primary home, the person who's selling it to you is 99% of the time will have paid less than what you're getting it for. So it's important not to get caught up in that. And the number that they're putting the property out there for, that's an asking price anyways. That is in no way is the actual valuation of a property. That's why you negotiate and you can put in either a higher offer or lower offer. That price does not mean that's what you have to buy the property for too. And it's just like, like you said, knowing your numbers, just like long-term rentals is doing that analysis. And if the numbers work on paying double than what they paid two years ago, then it still works for you. Don't get stuck in that mindset like, oh, I don't want to pay double than what they just paid two years ago. There's no way it's, they put in that much. I hear all the time, there's not, they didn't do that much work to it. They didn't do anything to it. I don't want to pay more than what they did. But if the numbers still work and it's a deal, grab onto it and, and run with it. Can, can so I add Avery, one thing? Can I add yeah. one thing on that, Ash? Just like, it, like in terms of the asking price as well, right? Like, like you said, it, it's really arbitrary. Right. Like mm -hmm. who cares if you paid yeah. $50,000 over asking, like what if they just priced a property really low? Right. Like what yeah. if the yeah. property was worth half a million, but they listed it for 400,000 just to see what would happen. So like, you know, I think oftentimes people get caught up on having to pay over asking, but to your, both of your points, it's like, as long as the number still makes sense, if you're paying over asking, it doesn't matter. If the property is expensive, it doesn't matter. At the end of the day, what is the return look like? And are you getting what you want for your money? Exactly. Yeah, to me, the purchase price is just a starting point to run my first analysis. And then from there, make adjustments of what I can pay for it, realistically. 
Uh, Avery, I want to go back to the software you mentioned, Air DNA and Price Lab. So Tony actually uh, showed me Air DNA before, and I, I'm somewhat familiar of that, but uh, not Price Lab. Would you be able to go through those two software real quick and just what would I look for on the software when I'm analyzing a market? What do I need to to pull actually from the software? What kind of data? Sure, sure. So Air DNA is actually a data company that specializes in measuring short-term rental performance. So there's a lot of stuff on their website that's really cool. I like to look at the market-wide data. for So you can go in there and drill down to even the number of bedrooms that you want. Um, so I typically buy four, four and five bedroom properties now. So I'll go look at... If I'm looking at a new market, I'll go four to five bedrooms, look at the gross annual income. Um, that's the most important number to me. I don't really care what the occupancy rate is, as long as it's not something really silly like 20%. And I don't really care what the average price per night is. I want to know what the annual income is. Uh, so you want to look at that. Uh, they do have a tool called the Rentalizer, that, but I don't love that because it there's a lot of intangibles that go into how much a property is making that it can't read because it's a computer. So basically the rentalizer, it takes the full market data and just drills down to a small sample of the properties that are in your neighborhood. But if you've got a really, really poorly managed property next door, or it can skew your data low, it can skew that rentalizer number low. Or if you've got one that is, you know, a spaceship that blasts off twice a week next door, it will skew it high. So uh, what I recommend doing is what we at the short-term shop call the enemy method, where you are going on Airbnb and just looking at the properties around you uh, and seeing, okay, this property is doing this much, this property is doing this much, and you're only going to be able to see like their next 60 days, how much they're getting per night, but you're able to look because the computer can't see, oh, this is furnished much better, this is everything's redone here, and this is like falling down. You need to go in there and look yourself to kind of figure that out. Um, so we call it the enemy method. You're going in and looking at your enemies in the neighborhood and kind of seeing how you can improve to where you might be able to get more per night than them or, or things like that. So anyway, that's the rentalizer. I look at the, the market wide data on air DNA and then price labs is not a data company. It is a pricing tool for when you, when you have your property, it's a pricing manager and it helps you price your property dynamically to make sure you're maximizing your price per night. And it just, that's just one function of it is the market dashboards. And honestly, Tony probably knows more about this than me. I've just hit like the export button a few times and seen like, <laughs> oh yeah, this is pretty cool. And this yeah. is right around what we're doing. So also another thing you can do is even if you're not planning on using a property manager, which we don't do, a lot of the big national property managers that have a lot of money have access to a lot of data that we as regular people just don't have. And a lot of them, you know, they want your business. So if you call them up and ask them for data on the different markets, they have all that and they're really willing to give it to you. So as a new investor, rookie, I'm starting out, don't have any properties. Uh, Air DNA is one to uh, purchase. And I think it's like what usually you pay per market when you're analyzing it, or you can do a subscription base. And then Price Lab, you don't need until you actually have the property. And then um, you can reach out to, to property managers uh, too yeah. in those areas to, to find out information. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, but what about, uh, analyzing the deal? So now that we know where to pull some of the information from, is there anything, uh, different or things you should be specific about that would be different than analyzing a long-term buy and hold? Yes. So you are going to have to, you're, you're going to have a lot more expenses than a long-term. Your cleaning fees are going to be your biggest one and a big kind of, uh, point of contention with short-term rental investors is when you're quoting a gross annual income, should it include cleaning fees or not? I think that when I quote gross annual income, it does include cleaning fees. And here's why. Because if you're using Airbnb and Verbo, at the end of the year, you're getting a 1099 on your total gross income, which includes the cleaning fees. So it can skew your calculations tax-wise if you're not including those. And then also there's income in the cleaning fees. You want to be charging your guests X amount over what your cleaner is charging you and there's income there. So it's kind of a little bit of a variable. So you do want to include that in your gross, um, but you want to cleaning fees, which you can also kind of figure out what those are by using the enemy method. You can see what your neighbor's cleaning fees are. And then um, obviously you have your electric cable, internet, all of that stuff. Um, so you want to average, I mean, extrapolate that out too, but uh, 
that's typically it. There's not a lot of really crazy expenses that with short-term rentals, it's really just the cleaning and maintenance fees and then your typical utilities. Yeah, and I think that's uh, a lot of people get hung up on the, you know, the revenue potential, the gross income that can come, but there's definitely a lot more expenses and management that need to to take place on a short-term rental. Uh, Tony, I use the, the calculator report that you gave me uh, to look at short-term rentals and it's on your website, I think, right? Yeah, people can Alpha pick Geek it up for free. Com. Yeah, alphageekcapital.com yeah. forward slash calculator. And it's just a, like a little Excel file that I actually use like every day when I'm, whenever I'm looking at deals. So you guys can pick that up there. Yeah, I, I, you guys, it's great. If you guys want to use it, if you're finding this uh, uh, information helpful and want to start plugging away and finding your market and finding your first short-term rental. <laughs> So Avery, just on, on the market selection piece, any final thoughts like for the rookies that have never done this before on any, I guess, any pitfalls or just things you see people do wrong when it comes to selecting their, their market? Select a market based on the tourism and the regulations, not based on what just a place that you like. Like my dad has a fishing camp in West Point, Mississippi that he loves, but and that he would probably short term rent if if he could convince me that it makes sense, but it doesn't because nobody's going to West Point, Mississippi. It's a tiny little town. So, you know, don't base it on your personal preferences, base it on the data. Got it. So I, I love the the data focus, right? Because that's how you make the right business decisions. Now, I, I want to transition a bit into the the management side, because outside of how do I choose my market? I feel like the next question that I get a lot is how the heck do I manage these, right? And you guys have eight, and I know you guys are self-managing these on your own. So I guess the first question is, why not hire a property manager for your short-term rentals? Like, why did you guys make the decision to do it on your own? Because the it's a it's an entirely different ball game than with long-term rentals. So the average short-term rental property management cut is 25% of your gross. And in a lot of markets that we're in, 35% is really more the norm. And to give you guys kind of uh, some perspective on just how much money that would be, uh, we only had... So in July, we just brought our eighth one on. So July, we only had seven properties online and we grossed $100,000 for July alone. So that's $25,000 for one month for a property manager. That's CEO level, not CEO, like that's quite very experienced upper management level salary if you pull that out over an entire year. And it's just not something that you, it, all of it can be done straight from your, your iPhone. Um, it's really just glorified scheduling and a few phone calls here and there. If something breaks, you know, if something breaks in my property that's a thousand miles away, I'm going to do the same thing as if, you know, my toilet breaks in, in my office behind me. Like, I don't know how to fix the toilet. I'm going to call somebody. So I'm going to call somebody, whether it's here or there. Uh, so it's just really a mindset thing that you kind of have to get over of there's, and plus there's lots of automation tools so that you're not having to, when I first started, I had to, at the beginning of each month, look at my calendars and write out the dates that my cleaner needed to go and send it to her. And I had to do it two separate ways to make sure that she didn't miss anything. And that was not efficient, but now channel managers take care of that for you. Uh, the channel managers, for those of you who don't know, those are the platforms that automate everything for you. They hook up to your Airbnb and, and VRBO accounts. Can you tell... They just send it right to the cleaner's calendar. Tell us what some examples of that would be. And Yeah, that yeah. Works. So yeah. Um, we use your porter. There's some other great ones out there. Uh, IGMS is the other really big one. Uh, Smart BNB is one. There's quite a few out there. Yeah, we use uh, Smart BNB in our business. And yeah, like you said, it, it, it automates so much of what people who aren't short-term rental operators would think is a manual process, right? Like when the guests books, they get an automated confirmation message. Before they check in, they get an automated like, welcome to our property message. The first day after they after their first night, they get a, hey, how's everything going message. Before they check out, there's a, hope you had a great stay message. Like so much of the automation or the communication is automated so that you as the host are really just stepping in when things or questions pop up that can't be like templated or, or things like that. So I, I know that you and Luke are really big into like streamlining uh, or streamlining your business what are some additional things you guys have done outside of leveraging like your porter um, to, to make the management process a little bit easier for you guys? So the biggest thing, honestly, is just going through all of the questions that every guest asks and making sure that in those templated emails that, sent, that are sent out, 
that all of those are answered. I mean, some of our templates are like a foot long paragraph because we're answering everything they could possibly ask in that email. So just really making sure they have all of the information, almost too much information up front is really going to save you a lot of time than having to answer the same question over and over again, because it's not in your template. So, I mean, really that's just the main thing is just overwhelming them with all of the information they could possibly have so that there are no questions. Are you, are you guys cleaning the properties yourself, Avery? How do you guys handle that part? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So we are not cleaning the properties ourselves. Uh, we have, so, um, and we help our clients do this too, where we help you get your cleaners and handymen and everybody boots on the ground that you need. But if you're just starting and you have no help, all you need is a cleaner and a handy man or woman. And those are your two core team members and you can build everything else out from there because between the two of those, somebody's going to know a roofer if you need one. Somebody's going to know an HVAC technician if you need one and you can build everything out from there. But those are your two core and your cleaner really being your most important. How how do I find a good cleaner, Avery? Like if if I'm never done this before, what resources, what locations, where should I, is there like a cleaning website where all these Airbnb cleaners are posted? What's, what's the best way? There is unfortunately not a website, but that is something that somebody should do. Uh, There's not a website. A lot of times they're not going to have their own individual websites either. So there's a few ways you can do it. Typically most markets, if there are a lot of short-term rentals there, they're going to have local short-term rental owner, Facebook groups, investor, Facebook groups, um, So definitely check that out. What we had to do uh, when we first started is we went on Airbnb and messaged all of our neighbors and said, oh my gosh, can we, would you mind sharing your cleaner information? A lot of them told us to buzz off, like, no, like rude. (laughs) And you're going to get doors in your face. You're going to get doors in your face. But all you need is for one person to bestow the kindness upon you to give you their cleaners information and a, a good way to kind of frame it for them is if they don't want to give it to you, you can say, well, listen, I'm buying this place that's two doors down from you and your cleaner wants more. They're going to take more properties if they're presented to them. So it's beneficial to you that my property is right next door and your cleaner isn't trying to run across town to a potential other property. So it's, it's good for you. It's good for everyone. If all of this cleaner's properties are right here next to each other. So you don't have to worry about them, you know, getting caught in traffic and being late. And, um, you're going to get told no a lot, but eventually someone will say yes. Or you just book a one night stay at one of those places and wait for the cleaner to show up the next day after checkout. I haven't had to go that far. I did. At the very beginning, there was one gas station uh, in the Smokies where there it's like the only gas station out in this one area where there's a lot of cabins, and we would and it was the place that has like uh, breakfast, like biscuits and stuff, and we would just hang out there and wait for cleaners to walk in and out and and get their number. Yeah, that's like going to, uh, you know, Home Depot or Lowe's to find a handyman or a contractor. Awesome. Awesome. Okay. The one last question I had for you before we move on to our mindset segment is what is your take on short-term rental arbitrage? So I think that's a really great way to build some extra cash flow if you need it. But at the end of the day, it is not investing. It is building a job for yourself rather than building wealth for yourself. So if you need that extra cash flow, it's a great way to start, but it should not be the end goal. Can you just describe too, real quick? I, sorry, I should have said that um, before what, what it is for everyone. Yes. Yes. So rental arbitrage is when you rent a property with a long-term lease for you to turn around and Airbnb it. And that's actually what I do. That's my only little Airbnb. And Tony and I were joking uh, before the episode started that we're going to tell everyone how to correctly run their first (laughs) short-term rental and how not to correctly (laughs) run it because mine is very, very mom and pops, like no soft or anything like that. But um, yeah. Okay. Tony, do you want to take us to our mindset segment? Yeah, absolutely. So Avery, you've obviously crushed it in the world of real estate investments since you started back in 2016. But if we go back to Avery, when you were, you know, hustling to save up the money for that first investment, what were some misconceptions um, or beliefs you had about being a real estate investor that turned out to not be true that you can sit back today and say, man, I can't believe I used to think that that was what it was like. When I first started real estate investors, it just seemed like something that other people are, that these nebulous rich people over there. That's, those are real estate investors. And I just, it felt like an unattainable goal. And I also think that I 
really made it out in my head to be more difficult, like more complicated than it actually is. Some of the things that I got so caught up about on those first few contracts, now I'm like embarrassed of myself. I'm like, oh my God, why did we get caught up about the HVAC has corrosion on it, but it's still working? Like we just got so caught up on a lot of little details that nowadays it's not even something that we think about with our properties. And I, I think that's a common theme amongst so many rookies is that, and, and rightfully so, or understandably so, because they've never done it before. So to them, some corrosion on the HVAC means you got to replace the whole thing, right? If there's a broken shingle, rip the whole roof off and put a new one on, right? But it's like, as you get some more, um, I think, maturity in the world of real estate investing, you, you're you able to do a better job of determining what's an actual obstacle, what's an actual concern versus one that's probably not really, right? Something that you're making it up to be. So love, 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 love that advice for sure. Today's uh, rookie rock star is Haley P. Um, and this question is, or this uh, rookie rock star is pulled from Facebook, but I want to let you guys know that not only in Facebook are we pulling the rookie rock stars, but also in the Bigger Pockets forums. So go into the forums. We have a whole rookie section and please share with us your success stories so we can share them here as the rookie rock star of the week. So Haley has been waiting a year and a half to make this post. Uh, She got a deal driving for dollars, purchased the property for $25,000 plus a cold beer, and then sold it for $47,000. So she wholesaled the property and did a double closing. The ARV on the property is $96,000. And the deal closed in Iowa while she was in Houston, Texas. Not a bad deal at all. And congratulations on taking action. She said, too, that she adapted her plan many times, got stuck in analysis paralysis, and was even made fun of for this dream of hers to do this. And every sacrifice was worth it. So anyone else is feeling like Haley and, you know, it's been a year and a half. It keep keep going because it's definitely worth it. Avery, before we before we let you go, uh, you mentioned at the top of the show about uh, a ten thirty one exchange and and taking that first uh, some of those first investments in Nashville and flipping them into into something bigger. Um, just kind of give us the backstory. What was how many properties did you have to sell, and, and what did you end up purchasing with those proceeds? And I guess before that, if you can just describe what a ten thirty one exchange is for the listeners that aren't familiar with it. Absolutely. So I'll probably butcher the ten thirty one exchange explanation, but basically it's when you sell a property and you take the the appreciation, so the equity that you made. So in this example, I bought the property for one hundred and twenty two thousand. I sold the property for three hundred and thirty seven thousand five hundred, and so I've got right around a little over two hundred thousand in equity. And you, if you don't buy another property using a ten thirty one exchange with that two hundred thousand, then you have to pay what's called capital gains taxes on it. If you do a 1031 exchange and take that 200000 and buy another property with it, you can defer those taxes until you sell the next property. Or if you never sell it, then you're just, you're doing good. So <laughs> I don't know what the correct actual thing that you do at the end of that is. Basically, but I took that 200000 put it into another property so I didn't have to pay taxes on it. And that was one it was only that one property. Uh, I had enough equity there that I went and put that down on a 25 unit apartment complex in the Midwest. And that will gross about 20,000 a month. Beautiful. And that's That's the power of real estate investing, right? Is that you can, you can take a small amount of money and turn it into something big through the the power of the 1031 exchange. Like you and I were, I think we were texting like the other week, right? Or something that I'm in the middle of one right now. And um, we bought a a short-term rental in Joshua Tree last year. Our total out-of-pocket expense to purchase that property was like $39,000. And we were able to parlay that into $200,000 almost in equity as well in the course of like a year. So we took this property in Joshua Tree that was probably going to grow somewhere around like $70,000. And we used that to buy a much larger cabin in the Smoky Mountains, which will hopefully do somewhere close to double of that, right? So it's like taking that money and making it work for you time and time again. Like that's the true power of real estate investing. 100%. Avery, thank you so much for uh, joining us today. Can you tell everyone uh, where they can reach out to you and find out some more information about you and about this really great resource that you have coming out too that we're all so excited <laughs> to get our hands on? <laughs> yes. So I have a book coming out on Bigger Pockets Publishing called Short-Term Rental, Long-Term Wealth. You can find that at biggerpockets.com slash store. 
And if you'd like to get a hold of me, you can find me on my website, theshorttermshop.com or mortgageshop.co, our mortgage arm, or you can hit me on Instagram at the short term shop. Avery, thank you so much. And I love the book title too. I wanted to be able to tell you that. <laughs> thank oh. you. Yeah, thank you for joining us. I'm Ashley at Wealth From Rentals and he's Tony at Tony J. Robinson. Thank you guys for listening and we will be back next Wednesday with another guest. Still, yeah.